This is Xi Ting welcoming you to Backstage, the life behind the music. This is an online series of conversations with pianists, an exploration of their remarkable artistic lives as performers, teachers, and advocates for music. Through talking, I hope to shed some light on their process, to get a glimpse into some of their music making, the real work that takes place before they or their students step out onto the stage. Thank you so much for being on the show with me, Mr. Perry. I um, have heard so much about you and you have been um, a legendary um, existence in the piano world. I think I would like to ask some questions um, that will um, tell me uh, some of your formative experience and what made you who you are as a musician and, and as a famous pedagogue. Um, so I think my first question will be um, any particularly uh, memorable formative experience uh, that you can think of right now. Um, I, for instance, I, I have heard a story that you study with um, Geinhardt at Eastman School, and then she made you play all the Bach inventions. Did that make sense to you at the time or? Um... Well, first of all, that's not one of my early experiences. That's one of my later experiences. And, uh, the, the story is wrong. She made me uh, study the D minor th three part invention the whole semester. So, you know, it's like telephone. These uh, stories have a life of their own. <laughs> yeah. Why did she make you do that? Because you were already um, a, I'm sure very accomplished as a pianist. Well, but otherwise, I wouldn't have gotten into Eastman, but she thought I needed some very hard training on exact contrapuntal playing while maintaining a good legato and beautiful sound and proper phrasing. And there's no better way to teach it than the, a Bach invention, three-part invention. We only have two hands. And once you go from two to three parts, it becomes much more of a challenge. P playing the notes is not the main thing. It's playing every voice as if you were the only person playing that one voice. And you have to do that with three voices. And if you can do that, you can do five, six, seven voices. But that's the big change from two to three. Yes, um, I was talking with um, Mr. Pompavodi, Antonio Pompavodi, uh, I am. And he mentioned that when he was a young student, he also went through all the box really than two. And uh -huh. That that's the single best thing he has ever done uh, to learn how to control lines and then control um, the sound he wants and yeah. and all that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, I have to say, playing any number of things itself is no is no key to success. The key to success is how you practice it. And uh, she felt that I could learn to, to play Bach well if I really played that prelude and fugue. I mean that three-part invention perfectly over a period of a semester. Uh, Dr. Rue mentioned that you have the most efficient technique when you're playing. And then I have also uh, seen videos of you. You play with such integrated technique and um, moving very efficiently. I was wondering who has um, influenced you to uh, Well, you know, I think we're a product of all the teachers we've had. I didn't have good teaching until I was in sixth grade. Then I had a marvelous teacher in my hometown of Virginia, Minnesota. And she gave me four lessons a week. My parents only paid for one. And two were piano lessons. One was a theory lesson and four was a music appreciation lesson where she would play symphonies and cantatas and leader. In other words, it was a whole range of teaching me to listen and appreciate all types of music, symphonic, vocal, chamber, uh, and uh, she did, she did, uh, I was going to say, uh, 
she she did fantastic things for my those those very important years from from eleven to seventeen years of age, you know, and so then I then I well actually longer because I went to junior college in Minnesota. That's right. So I was with her for actually sixth grade to junior in college, and I started when I was in 10th grade, I think, having uh, lessons in the summer in Duluth, Minnesota, which was only 65 miles away, a good hour and 15 minutes drive. And uh, I studied with Mr. Frank Mannheimer, who is American, but uh, was a student of Aegon Petri and uh, the very famous pedagogue from England, Tobias Maté. And so between those two people, him in the summer and her in the school year, I had pretty fantastic uh, training. On the other hand, it was enhanced by the fact that I listened to a lot of music. Uh, we didn't have uh, the recordings that we have now and uh, fortunately, we didn't have YouTube to listen to all those bad recordings either. But we did have some, and I uh, and we had the broadcasts of the NBC orchestra that I could listen to every night, actually, when I went to bed, when my parents thought I was sleeping. I was listening to Toscanini and the NBC orchestra. So I was always interested in music with a capital M, not piano music with a capital P. And, and I think that's, that really broadened my, my outlook. After I finished my master's degree at Eastman, I went to Vienna, Austria, where I was three years listening to the Vienna Philharmonic and the, the Viennese Opera. And that had an incredible influence on me too. I didn't have a good teacher in Vienna the first two years I was there, but I went summers to Rome and Salzburg and studied with Carlo Zecchi. Carlo Zecchi had been a student of Schnabel's and uh, some other really great people too. Who, who else? I can't remember now, but you know, the, the, those figures that you... Bissoni. He studied with Bissoni and he studied with... Uh, 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 Arthur Schnabel. So I was with him every summer for three years. I was with, I finally got a good teacher the third year I was in, in the Vienna uh, Academy, and that was Vladislav Kendra from Poland, who really opened me up on the playing of Chopin, especially Mazurkas, which I had no idea of when I went there. So you might say that. Uh, from the time I graduated from high school, my influences were totally European, which, which shaped me. But it was a comfort zone too. I mean, the, the uh, way people played, especially orchestrally, I learned a lot more about music from listening to orchestras than I did from listening to pianists, I better say. And uh, then I started teaching. And I, uh, but I was teaching while I was still at Eastman. Students were coming to me all the time. And I was listening to everybody's program. It didn't matter who, who they were studying with. Every, I got known as a person that I was, that it was good to play for, because I could help them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you asked that question, you, you wanted a, a breakaway uh, thing that shaped me. It's never that way. It's the day to day. One likes to think that this, wow, Eureka, <laughs> I've discovered the world. It doesn't work that way, it never has. It's, it's that daily learning, observing, putting into practice, 
trying things, experimentation. What's wrong with most people is that they settle on a way of playing, not always by intention, very often just so by the line of least resistance. And then they keep playing that way and they never play any other way the rest of their life. That's, uh, and the one thing that can change that is early exposure to, to playing with somebody else. You can, do, you can uh, really <laughs> deceive yourself into thinking you're playing what you think you're playing. And <clears throat> when you start playing with somebody else and uh, it's not going the way you thought it would, that's when you find out what you're really doing. <laughs> and I think you have such a um, wonderful success over the years as a teacher yourself. What kind of qualities do you look what do I look for? Yeah. You know, a lot of it is uh, is gut feelings, don't you? I mean, uh, we have to be analytical in any in any field. One has to be analytical, but when it comes down to choices, I think your reaction is always better than your line of reasoning. I sincerely believe that in general. Your, your subconscious cannot be wrecked by overthinking or by confused thinking. But to get to that point, you have to have learned a lot previous to that. But I, I guess it's something, some, somewhat like the football coach looking for a player. You look at that and you see what the potential is. You don't judge by how well they're playing at that time, because that could be the end of it. You judge by what you think that person may be capable of. And usually you're right. 97% of the time you're right. You get, you get fooled once in a while, but, but uh, not often, because you could also tell when it's so polished that you know that that person has worked on that piece for three years. That you can tell too. And that's, that's always a turn off for me because they don't have another three years to learn the next program. Yeah. How is that your students do so well in competitions? I don't think anyone else in, um, could say on their bio that their students have won um, most of the major competitions. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's luck. I, I really try when I teach to search for the, the voice within the student. I mean, you, teaching involves two very opposite things. One is building upon a student's strengths, really looking at their strengths and, and, and giving them the repertoire and teaching them in such a way as to enhance what is basic to their musical voice. The second and opposite thing is if they have big holes in their background, then you have to, you have to concentrate on that also. But the, those, those pieces aren't the ones you're gonna tell them to play in the competition. That's what, what you're gonna to do to try to make them a complete pianist. But it's necessary. It's necessary. Again, maybe my answers are too subjective for your purposes, but otherwise it's a lie. Otherwise it's, it's, uh, it's being a charlatan if you really come up with definite answers on these things. Have you noticed that very few people that have won major competitions have gone on to a career. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think because... a very good example is Daniel Trifnov. He did not win the Chopin competition, but he's doing so much better than the winner. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Yes. There are people who are competitors. They stand out in competitions. They're all... <clears throat> artists they give recitals and they play. Right, but whose fault is that? That's the judge's fault. Yeah. 
they get titillated by that technique. You can't blame the, the uh, competitors for playing the way they believe. You can only blame the judges for not. I tell you what happens with every every competition. Most of the very good people are thrown out in the first competition, the first round, because maybe they're not the best ones for playing etudes. Second round comes and the judges start squirming and complaining. Oh, this the students just aren't so good. As they used to be, or something. And comes to the finals, and then they start complaining more. Nobody can play a big piece. It, it's all it's in little sections. Well, who's responsible for that? It's them. They chose the wrong people in the first round. The people exist. It's just and now there's some competitions that don't even have a a pre-competition uh, recording. They just judge on your on your curriculum vitae. So they will take somebody that's already won three competitions. But what about the people that haven't entered a competition yet? They might be better, but they're not. They don't even listen to them play anymore. But. I like competitions for one reason. It makes people work very hard yeah. and they learn a lot of repertoire and they polish their pieces and they learn how to balance a big repertoire and keep it going. And once in a while, they'll play in that competition and somebody will hear them and support them like Rubenstein did with one of those students who didn't get into the finals in one of the Chopin competitions. I forget the name now. You know the story though, right? Yeah. He created a, a prize that was larger than the first prize of the competition. He gave it to that person that didn't make it into the finals because he thought that person had the most to offer. Are there anything that you would like to um, maybe talk to to the future generation of uh, young professionals who are trying to make it young pianists. I think I think for right now, um, a lot of people are struggling with this, um, not being able to perform online. I'm oh, it's re it's really terrible right now. It's terrible for for all artists, but performing artists especially, they don't have any. You can't even play a decent school recital with with audience i mean it's not that those school recitals always had a big audience but now there's none uh, you, you know I, I i pour over this problem you you see that the amount the number of people the percentage of people that appreciate this music seems to be getting less all the time i hope we have a renaissance but you know, like, like yourself and myself, you're in this because you cherish and respect so much that great music. You want to play it. You want to give that emotional thing you feel to the people you play for. But this is a very unusual time, but it could be it could be a very negative uh, permanence. I just, I just hope not. A lot of people are doing a lot online now, and uh, I, I give them credit. I'm doing all my teaching online, which is not bad. But my students are so advanced. I would hate to, I would hate to be doing this with seven-year-olds or eight-year-olds that are just learning how, I don't know how people do that. A lot of people are doing online recitals. That's, that's helpful. Uh -huh. yeah, at least they're still playing. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Thank you so much, Mr. Perry. It's been a it, pleasure. It's great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank Take you. care. You yeah. too.
，拜拜。